a number of discussion questions had come up regarding laxatives or concerns about that. So that was kind of the rationale behind putting a laxative talk into our didactic curriculum, not something we had done in the past. So with that in mind, um, trying to keep a focus on big picture and clinical applicability, um, I hope to accomplish a couple things today. So listing the, the classes of laxatives that we have to treat constipation, I'm really going to focus on the over-the-counter um, products. So things that are readily available that might be recommended um, for the patients or that they may just take themselves. There's a handful of other medications that are prescription specifically for um, constipation, but those, in order to do justice to the topic, I thought it'd be best just to focus on the OTC things first. We're going to identify some of the common side effects. So what might the patients experience if they're taking these? And then look at some of the situations on where these might best fit, because we do have um, quite an array from just acute use to something that could potentially be utilized every day. So let's get started. As Dr. Messamore had mentioned, we have a large number of medications that have been associated with constipation. So it's not uncommon that the medications prescribed for a mental health condition would be ones that then are going on to cause a drug-related adverse effect. So potentially um, having mental health providers asking questions, checking in on constipation can be beneficial. With that in mind, there may be two different complaints that patients will report. Um, so one may be that they have a difficult time when they have a bowel movement. So their frequency is fine, but they do strain when they are trying to have a bowel movement. The second is a change in the frequency where they, they're not actually having um, a bowel movement on a regular basis, and that could be more problematic. And those go in two different directions, so we will refer back to those um, throughout the presentation. So what can we do about it? Um, our treatment for constipation, we do have quite a few options that are available for the patients. Um, we'll talk about uh, three, I was gonna say two, it's um, actually three different non-pharmacologic strategies that all patients should be using. But in the patients who have maybe intermittent constipation or something that's a little bit more um, acute and problematic for them, we do have this whole list of agents that we could potentially use. They're not in alphabetical order. I group them because we're going to talk about them kind of in, um, in dyad, so two, two classes at a time. In the first class, <laughs> we have our bulk forming laxatives and the emollients. Um, so these would be things like your psyllium, the Metamucil that's available um, for patients. There's quite a few different um, bulk forming laxative products that are available, things that are in wafer form, things that are in pill form, powder form, chewable gummy form. Um, so there's a lot of different options that the patients could potentially use. A number of them are encouraged to be, um, to be used for um, sometimes helping with weight, encouraging patients to feel more full. Sometimes patients are encouraged to um, increase their fiber intake if they um, have high cholesterol or some other condition. So they may be starting to utilize these products for other reasons other than just the constipation. So what are these going to do? So these are non-absorbable. So they're essentially um, a product that's gonna stay in the intestine and it's going to swell. It's going to absorb a lot of the water um, that's in that cavity and it's gonna create bulk. Um, this was a picture that I found from a nursing program um, that I actually thought did a nice job of being able to, to demonstrate it mixes with what's in the intestine and really helps move, move things forward. Onset of effect um, for assisting with constipation is gonna be usually between 12 and 24 hours. So not something that's gonna happen right away. In some patients, it may take a little bit longer period of time. Side effect, for the most part, most of these are relatively well tolerated. Patients may say that they have some bloating, maybe some cramping or some flatulence, but for the most part, they do tend to be relatively well tolerated. The issue or concern with this um, twofold. So it's going to stay in the intestine, it's going to swell, it's going to absorb whatever is there. There is the potential that it could interfere with absorption of other medications. Um, so if they're 
mixing um, their psyllium, their Metamucil in a drink, and that's what they use to drink down their medications in the morning, that could be problematic where they're not getting all of their medicine absorbed because it gets stuck in the, um, the psyllium slush that's in the GI tract. The other big issue is adequate hydration is vitally important. So this is a product that's gonna absorb water and stay in the GI tract. If the patient is not well hydrated, it can lead to an obstruction. Um, so that can be really problematic. For patients who are having difficulty with the frequency of their bowel movements, this may not be the agent for them. Um, if they just feel that maybe it's a little bit more difficult, this could potentially help because it's gonna keep more fluid um, in the intestines. But if they're really not um, having bowel movements on a regular basis, things just aren't moving, we're gonna need to go in a different direction because if it's not moving and this sits there, it could harden and create that obstruction that could be problematic. And as Dr. Messamore um, had mentioned, that tends to be some of the problems that we do see in patients who are on clozapine. So absolutely have to be hydrated and maybe not ideal for, for those type of patients that really are struggling with more severe constipation. The other class of agents that we might see used um, a little bit more frequently are some of the emollient agents. When I was in pharmacy school, they described this to us as the soap. Um, so docusate sodium and docusate calcium. So it's actually a surfactant, so almost like a soap that can kind of coat and help soften some of the fecal material in the intestine. Again, it's not going to be absorbed. This one is not as likely to interfere with absorption, so we're not as worried about taking this um, with the other medications as we are with those bulk forming laxatives. It can cause some cramping, in some cases, patients may have diarrhea, um, but for the most part, this does tend to be relatively well tolerated. It doesn't often get used alone for treatment of constipation. Um, if patients are saying, you know, um, I go on a regular basis, but it's difficult, um, I have to strain in order to have a bowel movement, then the, these would be really good options for them. If they're saying I'm not going frequently, then potentially we need to look at pairing this up with maybe a stimulant or something else. So to kind of hit the pause button with those two classes, um, they can be used occasionally. So if a patient just once in a while is really having trouble um, feeling that they have to strain a lot to go to the bathroom, um, this could potentially be an issue. I had promised you those um, other treatment options. These could be added, um, so the DocuSate products as well as the fiber might be added in addition to hydration, exercise, and encouraging a high fiber diet just to not have constipation. If we know we're starting you on a medicine that might cause constipation, maybe that's something we do ahead of time proactively to try to prevent that from happening. And both of these, the bulk forming laxatives as well as those emollients, the DocuSate products, um, those could be used in combination, so we can use it with something else if we need to. Um, but these may have a role less for there is constipation, it's kind of a big problem right now, we need to get full evacuation, that's not what these are going to do. But if we're, well, maybe we have a little bit of trouble, we could use some assistance, something that's going to bolster that, then that's where these could play a role, and you might see them used on a regular basis. Switching gears a little bit, um, we have a couple other agents that we could use if there are a little bit more problematic. So you're going to see not really having problems, starting to have some trouble. We need full evacuation at this point. Um, so we're kind of in the middle category here. So our hyperosmotic agents. So these are compounds that tend to be bigger compounds. They're going to stay right in the GI tract and they're going to pull water into the, the intestines. Um, again, that can help with the constipation. So um, it goes down in osmotic gradient. So if the patient's taking something like the Miralax, the polyethylene glycol, those molecules stay in the intestine and the body's like, hey, wait a minute, there's all these big molecules in the intestine, we need water to come in to kind of dilute those out. Um, so by keeping them there, we can get extra water into the intestine, not absorbed, not incredibly likely to cause problems with um, the absorption of other medications, but we really should separate it from things like 
um, thyroid hormones or um, some of our blood thinners like Coumadin that are really kind of sensitive to that, but not as much of an issue with some of the other medicines. Again, may not happen right away. Um, so may take about 12 to 24 hours to see an effect. Um, patients um, do report some bloating, some cramping, potentially some flatulence here as well. So we're increasing, um, they might report some abdominal discomfort because we're increasing the amount of fluid that's, um, that's in their intestines. So they might feel a little bit uncomfortable. This has been used much more frequently um, on the outpatient basis. And there, there may be some individuals who use this on a regular basis. Um, so sometimes it's used for eating disorder patients to kind of jumpstart the, the GI tract. So um, you may see some patients that use this for, um, for a while on a, on a regular basis. So a little bit like those other agents, but it also can be used just short term. If somebody's having trouble for a little bit, they could use it for a couple weeks um, and then take a trial off it and see if things have, have improved. The other class that's kind of in this category are the stimulants. Um, so there's at least three different ones that are over the counter. So Senna, the Bisacodyl, and Castor Oil. Um, so Castor Oil from a um, tolerability and acceptability standpoint doesn't tend to be used um, very frequently. So Senna and Bisacodyl tend to be the two that, are, that we see more, more commonly. What these are gonna do is actually cause some local irritation um, in the intestine. And what that's gonna do is it's going to make the smooth muscles in the intestine start to contract. So it'll actually force those muscles to contract to um, improve the intestinal motility, to help move things along. These are gonna work a little bit faster. So they're agitating those muscles. We're gonna get some muscle contraction. So you can see some um, effect within six to 24 hours. So it might be a little bit faster than what we see with, with those other medicines we've talked about. Because we are getting that muscle contraction, um, cramping does tend to be problematic uh, for patients. We can also see diarrhea, which may lead to some dehydration. Um, so it will help move things along in the GI tract. Sometimes it goes a little bit faster, um, maybe than what patients are used to. So this would be a product that could potentially be used in a patient that is um, experiencing constipation. For some of your um, group homes for individuals that might be um, in assisted living or having people who come in to check on them. Um, sometimes we have a standing order, so they'll have a stimulant on board if a patient hasn't had a bowel movement in three or four days. Um, so they don't have to take it every day. This isn't something we want um, a patient taking every day, but every few days if, if they haven't had a bowel movement, then we have this on board. Um, and it's kind of a standing order that if they need it, it's there, um, but it's not something that we use only once in a while. So kind of plays a little bit more of that middle field. So not all of the time, but might be a little bit more consistent than, um, than the last group of medicines we're gonna talk about. So this would, both of those classes may be used a little bit more commonly in patients who are reporting, hey, I'm having trouble either, um, either with straining when um, I have a bowel movement or with infrequent bowel movements. The hyperosmotic, so that's your polyethylene glycol, the, um, the Miralax, that could be used every day, maybe for short bits of time. There are some patients who use it all of the time, um, but ideally we'd like to use it for a little bit and then see if the patient can do without. The stimulants are a little bit more as needed, but they could be something that's part of a, a patient's regular regimen. Um, but again, it can be really irritating to um, to the belly, to the intestines. That's what it's supposed to do to cause those muscle contractions. So not something that most patients are going to take every day. The other thing is there are some concerns that if they're using stimulants on a regular basis that um, potentially the body stops sending its own signals. It's really relying on that medicine to send the signal. Um, so another reason why we'd wanna use this relatively infrequently if possible. So a couple times a week. Our last class, um, are gonna be agents that we see used um, even more infrequently. So a patient who um, really has struggled um, going to the bathroom, they haven't had a bowel movement in a while, maybe they've tried some other products and that hasn't helped, um, or we believe that they might be at, starting to be at risk, right? We, we really need to make sure that, that they're able to um, clear out their intestines. So lubricants are one of them, mineral oil, 
is um, the most common ingredient in, in a number of the over-the-counter products. So it actually coats um, the fecal material and prevents the reabsorption of water. Um, so we start in the stomach, um, as the stomach breaks down your food and it dumps in a whole bunch of fluid, we get into the small intestine and it starts to absorb, right? Starts to absorb some of the fluid and um, uh, all of the calories and nutrients and minerals from, from our food. And we start to see um, that fecal material getting dried out, um, whatever's left in the intestine. This will help coat that and keep more of the fluid in there um, so that it can be moved out. So kind of the the more fluid that's in there, the easier it is to, to move it through the intestine. Again, this is gonna work a little bit faster. So onset in about six to eight hours. Um, one of the concerns that they have, so mineral oil can be taken in a couple different ways. Um, so it can be taken orally or it's also present as an enema. Um, if it's used as an enema, actually the onset of action is even faster. Um, so it tends to be um, effective in less than an hour. If they're using it orally, it does tend to take the six to eight hours. It's got longer to go. But if it's used orally, there is a risk of aspiration um, of the mineral oil and then resulting lipid pneumonia. Um, so it really is important if they're taking it orally that they stay upright, um, that they're not immediately laying down, that they're able to swallow well, that there aren't any swallowing problems. Um, so for that reason, we don't see it used incredibly often, just really in, in cases where patients um, have been struggling and we need something that's going to have more immediate effects. The last class um, are saline. So this is going to do the same thing. So that osmotic gradient. So um, any of these combinations, that last one is, um, is the ingredients for an enema. Um, these are all electrolytes in solution that really are going to pull more liquid into the intestines to help move all of that fecal material through the intestines. So onset of action tends to be relatively quickly. Um, so they can have effects within a half hour. Um, for a number of these products are used as prep. Um, if a patient is getting ready for a colonoscopy, some of these have, have been used to assist with the prep to help clean out the, the intestines. Um, but it really would be important that a patient does this while they're home. Um, so they really need to have relatively quick access to, to a bathroom. Because we're seeing relatively rapid um, evacuation of the intestines, um, cramping, dehydration, in some cases, um, it can make a patient really nauseous and potentially vomit um, because it's pulling some of the, the liquid into the stomach as well. We can see some electrolyte shifts. Um, so there's magnesium in um, at least the first two that are listed. Um, so patients who are using this a little bit more frequently are at risk potentially for having hypermagnesemia. Um, it is something we'd wanna keep in mind for patients that may have some renal issues. So with both of those, those are more for, okay, patient is complaining of constipation. It's been a big problem. We need something that's going to be effective right now. Um, so something that's a little bit more immediate and something we're only going to use every once in a while. So this is definitely going to be our as needed. Um, if the patient finds that they really need these on a regular basis, then we need to take a step back and look at a, a full workup um, and medical evaluation. So if it is from the meds, can we do something different? Um, because we really don't want the patient having to rely on this on a regular basis um, in order to have bowel movements. We gotta look at what, what our other options may be. So just in summary, so we have a whole bunch of options to help treat constipation, which could be a result of our mental health medications. Um, those lifestyle changes, so encouraging physical activity, the hydration, increasing the fiber um, in their diet, that could be helpful for all patients. Um, so definitely could be recommended regardless of where they are. But if patients are starting to potentially have some trouble or they think they might have trouble, things like our bulk forming um, agents, the emollients like the DocuSate could be things that we add on board preemptively to, to assist with that. Um, if they do look that they're having a little bit of trouble, maybe even those hyperosmotics, the polyethylene glycol could be used on a regular basis, hopefully short term, um, and then be able to see if the patient would be okay without them. For patients that really are having much more difficulty, um, either straining or with frequency, then we look to um, some of 
the, the more potent agents that are going to work a little bit more quickly, but that are going to um, cause a little bit more distress. So the stimulants, the lubricants, and then those saline products. Um, but again, as infrequently as we could utilize those. So potential things that patients could pick up um, over the counter, some of them do. Um, they may impact some of the absorption of our other medicines. Um, so not a bad idea to be checking in on, on this and seeing if patients are having any difficulty, um, especially as common as constipation maybe with some of our medicines. <laughs> 